everybody, I'm back. All right, so we're gonna do part two today. I'm um, really sorry about the exam getting moved to next week. So uh, just to recap, our exam two will be on November 7th on your prospective campuses. Okay. So um, we already went over all this last week, our bradycardia. Okay, so why do electrolytes matter? So um, in phase zero, we're dealing with um, rapid depolarization. So we're, we're looking at sodium channels. So when our sodium levels are off, um, that will affect this phase. And we're gonna be looking at some medications that affect the sodium channels themselves, things like procainamide and lidocaine, and even to a lesser extent, um, amiodarone. Um, phase two is looking at the um, slow calcium channels and potassium channels. And then phase three is repolarization due to opening of the potassium channels. So um, why am I mentioning this? Well, electrolytes do matter. And sometimes a simple fix, instead of pushing all of these medications, is checking our patient's serum electrolytes and making a correction. Um, I know this is probably not too much information, but when my mother-in-law got her uh, knee surgery a couple of years ago, she has a... Um, hypertension, which she takes metoprolol for. And her heart rate is usually like a metronome, 60 beats per minute. You can almost set your watch to it. And I received a phone call from the hospital that she was in a tachycardia following her um, surgery. And when I went in, it turned out that she had an electrolyte abnormality. Her potassium level had dropped from all this, uh, the fluids they receive in surgery and things like that. So it was a simple correction. As soon as they corrected her potassium, her heart rate came right back down to its normal. So that's why electrolytes do matter. Am I gonna test you on this slide and you have to know what phase zero is? No, but I want you to remember that sometimes it really is a matter of electrolytes, okay? Okay, so class one. Those are sodium channel blockers and class one is broken up into 1A, 1B and 1C drugs. Again, I'm not testing you on which ones are 1A and which ones are 1B. I just want you to realize that we're talking about movement of sodium. Class four, those are our calcium channel blockers. So when we talk about diltiazem or cardizem, we're talking about um, blocking the movement of calcium, all right? Class three, those are our potassium channel blockers, okay? And then class two, those are our beta blockers. So you should be pretty familiar with class two by now, okay? So class two drugs inhibit um, the ad adrenergic, I can never say that word. So it's the nervous system, right? Sympathetic nervous system, stimulation of the cardiac tissue. This also depends on an intact um, nerve connecting to your heart. So when we get into things like um, heart transplants next month, uh, not next month, next semester, when we start talking about heart transplants, remember that we've severed the nerves in that new heart. So a lot of the um, things that we take for granted in a uh, normally innervated heart don't actually affect a heart that has been transplanted. So when we give someone epinephrine and they've had a new heart from a heart transplant, it's not going to cause an increase in heart rate like it would in a normal person. Okay, enough about that. All right, so conceptual overview for tachyarrhythmias. Uh, I know I've said this over and over again, but cardiac output really does equal heart rate times stroke volume. And our heart will compensate. So if our stroke volume drops for whatever reason, maybe we're dry, or they gave us too many um, diuretics, we got an overdose of Lasix, and now um, we have a very low stroke volume, or our patient is bleeding, okay? Our heart will, comp will compensate by increasing the heart rate, right? So that it can feed itself first. Unfortunately, there is a limit to that. So once we reach, you know, 140, 150, 160, depending on the text that you use, usually around 150 is where we start thinking. Um, we lose the filling time for the ventricles. So we can speed up and inc increase cardiac output only up to a certain beat per minute. Once you get past that, depending on the individual, we now we're fighting a losing battle. It, the heart's beating too fast to fill. And so no matter what, we're gonna lose cardiac output, okay? So the goal of therapy is to lower the heart rate if we have a tachyarrhythmia. Tachycardia at rest is always bad, right? So if I'm laying in bed trying to sleep and my heart rate is going 150, that's not good, all right? 
tachycardia when we're expecting it is expected. So if I was going to, for instance, run up six flights of stairs, you better believe my heart would be trying to compensate by increasing heart rate, right? So my body is going to try and deliver more oxygen to my, you know, leg muscles because bringing me up six flights of stairs is a lot of work, okay? We expect that. Laying in bed without a reason and your heart is going fast, that's always, there's some kind of pathologic cause, all right? So um, we want to lower the heart rate if we can and support fluid volume, okay? Usually the cause is some kind of drop in volume. Um, and if we fix that, we give the patient fluids, then we can improve the heart rate, okay? Sometimes that's not the case um, when we deal with things like CHF, right? So sometimes it's a floppy heart, and sometimes we give medications to improve the actual squeeze of the heart. We'll go into that in more detail in the spring when we talk about um, really diseased hearts and cardiogenic shock. But for right now, someone who's tachycardic at rest, we need to figure out the cause and fix it, lower the heart rate and support their fluid volume. All right. All right. So we've got our speedy guy, adult tachycardia with a pulse. We're going to talk about people without a pulse later on. Um, so now we're going to assess for the appropriate of the clinical situation. So usually we're looking at a heart rate above 150, okay? And that's when we're gonna say, okay, it's probably not a sinus tachycardia caused by exertion. It's probably something going on with the heart, all right? And then we're gonna treat um, the underlying, identify and treat the cause. So is it because they have a, a really high fever? Is it because they just had a baby and now they're bleeding out? Is what what is the cause, all right? always maintain a patent airway. So we're always doing our ABCs every single time. Oxygen, if they're hypoxemic. So if our pulse ox is a little low and we also have a heart that's beating very, very fast, we want to support that patient with a little bit of oxygen, okay? And we want to place them on a cardiac monitor. What's the rhythm? How is this affecting our cardiac output and how is this affecting our blood pressure, right? Okay, so our box number three, our, is it persistent? Is it causing hypotension? Do they have altered mental status, signs of shock, um, chest pain? That means our heart's going so fast, it can't even feed itself. And now our heart is showing signs of stress. We want a happy, perfused heart. We don't want one that hurts and where cells are dying, all right? Or do we have signs of acute heart failure? Is the heart just incapable of keeping up? Now, are we showing signs of edema or pulmonary edema? Okay. So yes. So if the answer is yes, and we don't have any time to fix this, we would do synchronized cardioversion. That's for your other class, because this is a farm class. We're going to talk about the drugs. So just remember that if that patient is so impaired with that high heart rate, we would actually consider shocking the heart. All right. Okay. No, if they have a wide QRS complex, then we might just consider it our 12 lead and talk to an expert, okay? Otherwise, if things, if we have a little bit of time and the patient isn't too sick, so they're able to maintain a blood pressure and things like that, then we have a little time to work with. So we're gonna get an IV, right? Probably need an IV. They either need fluids or a medication or something. Bagel maneuvers. So I'm gonna put my little mouse next to that vagal maneuvers. So we know that we have two, um, we have our sympathetic nervous system and we have our parasympathetic nervous system. So sympathetic is our fight or flight and parasympathetic is rest and digest. So the vagus nerve is that parasympathetic nerve that you know helps us lower heart rate. How do we activate that? We do vagal maneuvers. So the patient may be told to take a deep breath and bear down, okay? A physician may do something called carotid um, massage where they, the physician would rub the patient's carotid artery and uh, that affects the baroreceptors. There's also um, diver's reflex where if you, you know, threw somebody into ice cold water, uh, there's a primitive reflex where it would lower their heart rate. Sometimes we try to mimic that by putting ice on the patient's nose. Um, but sometimes vagal maneuvers are enough where the parasympathetic nervous system can take over and lower the heart rate, okay? 
And then we come to some of our old friends, right? If that doesn't work, um, we can try something called adenosine. And we'll go over that in the next slide. Or a beta blocker, or a calcium channel blocker, or, oh, I don't know, con consider expert consultation. I don't know about you, but if I have a patient with a tachyarrhythmia who's showing signs of stress, I would want a cardiologist there, okay? So all this stuff on the side next to here, the synchronized cardio version, for your 2040 class, you're going to be talking about that. So yes, there are other things that we try first. If they're symptomatic, meaning they do not have a blood pressure or um, they don't have enough blood to their brain to keep you know, awake and alert, then we're going to do things over here with some electricity. Okay. Now let's take a look at our rhythm down below. We know it's fast. So how, how fast is this? Well, the most precise method, as I'm sure you've already talked about this in class, is you count all these teeny, teeny, teeny little squares, right? And then you take that number and you divide it into 1,500, and that gives you the heart rate, okay? And you've heard a lot about wide complex or narrow complex QRSs. All we mean is, is that the actual QRS, this is the amount of time that it took for that waveform to form, is if it's less than two and a half boxes, it's considered a narrow complex. I, um, when I teach this in person, I you know make fun of our skinny girls, but a normal QRS complex is 0 0.04 to 0 0.10. So we want our skinny girls to be a size 10 or less, right? And, and up in here, you'll see it says it's a 0.12. Depending on the textbook or the source, it may be 0.12 or below. Okay, so 0.04 to 0.12 or 0.04 to 0.10, depending on the, the textbook. So those are our skinny girls. And we want a skinny QRS complex because that means it was generated from one of the atria, okay? And hopefully it was generated from the SA node. But down here, we can't tell because there's no discernible P wave. And so the P and the T have kind of morphed into this triangular mess. It, the heart is going too fast for us to even determine what source this is coming from. We know it's from above the ventricle because these, these complexes are relatively narrow. So if we were to really you know, point this out, it's probably you know, two boxes or less. So this is a skinny one, right? And that means it's generated above the ventricles, which is why we call it a supraventricular tachycardia, meaning the source is from above the ventricles, okay? That's all that that means. We wanna slow this down to see more what's, you know, is this some kind of other arrhythmia? Or is it, a, uh, is it really from the sinus area? Though going as fast as it is, it's most likely not sinus, all right? It's probably some, you know, bad thing happening to this patient, okay? All right, so the first med, first med, this isn't the first intervention, right? We're gonna start up here, but um, we may try to do medication instead. So adenosine is used for narrow complex tachycardias or regular wide complex, meaning it, it's got a, a nice regular rhythm to it, okay? So the first dose we give, this, and this is a standard dose, by the way, um, it's six milligrams rapid IV push. And I mean rapid. Fast, 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 fast. This medication has an incredibly short half-life in the matter of seconds. Just to, you know, an FYI for people who are interested, this is a farm class. So does anyone know what adenosine really does? Adenosine is a natural um, chemical found in our body. And it's, um, I like to equate it to like driving on the highway. And you want to tap your foot on the brake once in a while. If you're going above 80, you're like, oh, I'm going a little too fast, and you tap. It's a little slow, right? We don't want to throw our foot on the brake and, and come to a, a complete stop while we're on the highway, right? Well, we don't want to do that to our heart normally either. So we naturally have adenosine to sort of tap on the brake and keep us from going too fast. A common... Um, I was going to say medication, but I guess a medic a common um, chemical that we all ingest, which m messes with adenosine, believe it or not, is caffeine. Now we talk about caffeine being a stimulant, but what it really does is it blocks those adenosine receptors. So the body isn't able to slow things down, which is why when you drink too much caffeine, your heart rate goes up. 
All right, so what do we do? Well, we have a heart that's going really, really fast and it's going out of control. So this is the time we're actually gonna go and stop, stop everything. We're gonna throw a huge dose of adenosine at the patient and literally stop the heart. But it only happens for like a few seconds. So it's okay, we're gonna bring them back. So it's six milligrams, really fast. So um, we're gonna follow it with an immediate flush. So you literally wanna push flush. It's not a like, well, let me push this over for two minutes and you know, wait and see, no, no. Push, flush, and sometimes we even raise the arm, okay? If that first dose doesn't work, then we will try a second dose, okay? So we wanna reset, and hopefully the SA node takes over when it comes back. Um, you kinda of have to warn your patients that you're doing this. This isn't like a surprise, this is, you're gonna feel really funny. Sometimes I equate it to, um, I tell my patients that, you know, it's gonna feel like you're at the very, you know when you're at the top of the, the roller coaster before you're about to go over and you feel like your heart's about to stop, well, this is really happening, okay? This literally stops the heart for a few seconds and it reboots. So we have to warn them that they're gonna feel funny. And um, this should go without saying, but we're stopping their heart. So you might wanna have them on a cardiac monitor. So they have to be monitored and you should have the crash cart, you know, within grabbing reach. So sometimes we'll actually put them on the, the crash cart, you know, the, um, the Zoll or whatever brand, um, you know, cardiac uh, defibrillator, we have them on the pads for that already, just in case, okay? All right, so that's what adenosine is. So the first dose is six milligrams, the second dose is 12. That's with a peripheral line. Um, if you're using a central line, meaning that the end of the catheter is actually floating right next to your heart, then you would use half the dose, three milligrams or six milligrams, all right? But it's always rapid, all right? Okay, our next one is another A. There's a lot of A drugs in here, and I'm really sorry you're gonna have to memorize them, is amiodarone. So this is used often for wide QRS tachycardia, and we also use it for dead people, so patients without a pulse. And sometimes we use it for atrial fibrillation. It's a really cool medication. It has alpha and beta blocking effects and also acts on calcium, sodium, and potassium channels. Here's the catch with this one though. It has a super duper long half-life, days and days. So once we give it, if we have, um, if it you know, works too well and we lower the heart too much, then we have to deal with those effects for a while, okay? but it's better than being dead. So we like to use it for dead people and to bring them back if they're in a ventricular arrhythmia. Okay, so administration for symptomatic tachycardia with a pulse is we wanna give them a loading dose of 150 milligrams over 10 minutes. This stuff's kind of hard to mix. For, um, a, a brand new nurse, and this is your first time giving amiodarone, make sure um, you have someone working with you because it can be kind of difficult to mix. Okay, and then we do a maintenance dose. Um, oh, so loading dose of 150, and then we can repeat it. Maintenance dose of one milligram per minute for six hours, and then half a milligram per minute for 18 hours. Like I said, it has a very long half-life. It sticks around for a long time. We're giving this to slow down someone's heart rate. So guess what? It can cause bradycardia and can cause severe hypotension as well. So um, you may need support to support the patient with a pacemaker or vasopressors after they've received this. All right, so um, this isn't a, a drug they give lightly. It's a serious medication, and it's usually used for wide QRS tachycardias. And when we get into the um, CPR portion of this, we also give it for patients who are in a lethal ventricular arrhythmia. All right, so another one of our class one medications is procainamide, um, and that affects sodium channels, all right? So it's an antiarrhythmic that blocks sodium channels. It works for patients with symptomatic wide QRS tachycardia. Sometimes we also give it to patients who have lots of ectopy. So they have, they're throwing lots of PVCs and are trying to figure out what's going on. So the loading dose is 20 to 50 milligrams per minute IV until we fix the problem. Um, or they become hypotensive. This has, um, can make patients severely hypotensive. The maximum dose is 17 milligrams. 
So, and then we will often run it on a continuous IV infusion, all right? It can cause such severe hypotension, so you have to really take vital signs. All of these medications are affecting central perfusion, so vital signs must be taken frequently, often every, sometimes every five minutes, sometimes every 15 minutes. This isn't somebody that's going to be on a med surge some floor. This is someone who's going to be in a, um, you know, a telemetry unit in the emergency department or in the ICU, okay? Um, because we're playing with sodium channels too, um, we have to avoid in patients who already have a prolonged QT interval um, because that can actually cause an arrhythmia all by itself. All right, and you never use this medication with patients with torsades to points. All right, so if they're in torsades, we're not going to use procainamide. Um, again, this we're playing with something that's blocking sodium channels, so this can cause a fatal arrhythmia as much as fix one. So we obviously it's the physician who makes the call, but you should know what the medication does and that you should expect hypotension regardless of why it's being used, um, it does cause hypotension. So we're often um, going to have to fix that after we fix the arrhythmia. All right. So Sotalol. So that's a beta blocker, LOL, ha, used for ventricular arrhythmias like VTAC. Um, but it also does some other stuff, like it you know, plays with the potassium channels a little bit. Um, it's used in severe atrial rhythms like atrial flutter too. All of these meds mess with some of the electrolyte channels, so it can cause a serious arrhythmia, all right? Um, we also need to make sure that we're monitoring the patient's QT interval before use. So when patients are being started on Sotolol, um, we often will do a pre-administration um, EKG just to see what their QT interval is before, okay? So it's a non-selective beta blocker. Um, and we have to keep them on the cardiac monitor. And like the other ones, can cause severe bradycardia and hypotension. Has a long half-life of 12 hours, so you do have to make sure you're watching their QT interval. So it can, um, you know, increase wheezing in patients who have asthma. So you need to do an assessment. If they're showing signs of bronchoconstriction, you need to make sure the physician is aware of that because this is a non-selective agent and it can you know, make that stuff even worse, all right? Okay, so other medications used for tachy, um, tachycardia, okay. These aren't new drugs to you, you guys know these already. We have beta blockers. So metoprolol, which is a selective, um, is sometimes used on a tachycardia before we go through the whole algorithm. Um, why? Because you know, it's a med that's uh, been around for a long time and it can be used to slow, a heart, uh, to slow the heart down. So if we have a narrow complex tachycardia, sometimes before they start even going through the algorithm, they'll actually give the patient a beta blocker first, okay? Calcium channel blockers like deltaism. Where have we seen this one before? Well, it's also used to, con uh, to help with hypertension. So um, calcium channel blockers, right? So very useful in controlling atrial tachycardias like AFib. So deltaism is used a lot with AFib patients, and it can be done on a continuous infusion. It can also be used for ventricular rhythms, but uh, it's not usually the first choice. So it's usually, you know, AFib or a flutter, even you're going to see deltaism. So the loading dose is 0.25 milligrams per kilogram IV bolus, and then it's maintained with 5 to 15 milligrams per hour. Okay. Hypotension, bradycardia, and other arrhythmias. So um, it's usually titrated for heart rate and blood pressure. So a typical order for diltiazem will be titrate for a heart rate less than 100 and a blood pressure greater than 90. So we're trying for that sweet spot where they're not tachycardic, but they're also not hypotensive. We want to keep them in that sweet spot in the middle. All right. So they have to be monitored while they're receiving IV doses. Okay. Now, this is where it gets fun. So adult cardiac arrest algorithm. So this means we have someone who died and we're hoping to make that a um, temporary situation. So if you come in as a new nurse and it's just so, oh, I'll never forget my first code. It's so scary. So if you walk in and you don't have uh, a pulse or you have agonal breathing, things like that, you're going to start CPR, right? You're not going to leave the room. You're it. 
So you're going to call for help and you're going to start doing your um, CAB, your compressions, right? So you start right away like a little energizer bunny and you're going to do some compressions. And then hopefully within two minutes, people come in, hopefully within 30 seconds after you call for a code blue. All right. So we're going to do this around and around and around. Right. So we start CPR. OK, compressions and then airways and breathing. Right. So hopefully you have one more person as the first responder, though, um, unless you work in an intensive care unit, ch chances are you don't have um, a bag valve mask in every room. So are we expecting, you know, a nurse that just walks into the room to do mouth to mouth? No. So you're going to do you're going to do your um, your compressions until help comes. All right. So we have right here if V-fib or pulses VTAC, we're going to shock them. Right. And then we're going to do CPR. Now, this is a farm class. This isn't a CPR class. We're going to look down. So we want IV or IO access. Right. So we, hopefully this patient has an IV already. If not, um, hopefully someone's there that can start an IV really quickly. Or if we have an IO um, access device, it's really, really quick um, that they can actually put in an intraosseous device within minutes. OK. Medication doses for patients without a pulse, i.e. dead. All right. Every dead person deserves a dose of epinephrine. So every dead person is going to get epinephrine every three to five minutes. It doesn't matter what rhythm they're in. If they're dead, they get a dose of epi, okay? It's one milligram fast IV push every three to five minutes. And how do I know that? It's over here, epinephrine. This is the actual, these are the cards that are on the, the code card. Epinephrine IV or IO, one milligram every three to five minutes, okay? So all while all this stuff in the middle is happening, we're doing continuous CPR. So our compressors are doing CPR, and if if we get an advanced airway, we don't even have to stop that for breath. So if they don't have an advanced airway, we're going to do 30 compressions to two ventilations, 30 compressions to two ventilations, um, and then we're going to try and fix the problem. Okay? So epi, one milligram, every three to five minutes. If we have something called uh, ventricular fibrillation or pulseless VTAC, we can shock them. If they don't have ventricular fibrillation or pulseless VTAC, all we're going to do is compressions and medications, right? So the other medication that we can give for V-fib or pulseless VTAC is amiodarone. Only instead of 150 milligrams, we're going to do 300 milligrams and then 150 for the second dose. And that's it. That's all I'm going to do on this slide. All this other stuff you did when you take your um, the CPR stuff isn't any different from basic um, CPR. Push hard and fast at least two inches. Minimize interruptions and compressions. Avoid excessive ventilation. Why? Because if you don't do this first box well, it doesn't matter what we do down here. If you don't do all of this, your patient's not going to come back. All right, we need to keep their um, ventilating and perfusing until we can figure out the cause. All right, so the shocking and all that stuff we're going to talk about in 2060. Okay, um, advanced airways we're going to talk about in 2060. But let's talk about down here, reversible causes. These are all our H's and T's. What happened, right? How, how did this patient die? They have to be pretty sick. So, you know, was it hypovolemia or was it hypo or hyperkalemia or was it one of the T's? Was it, you know, a heart attack, which is what the coronary thrombosis is? Or did they throw a gigantic PE? Who knows, right? All we need to knew, uh, do as a nurse is we need to start CPR, get help. And then if you're the medicating nurse, know that if you have someone without a pulse, you are absolutely going to give them a dose of epinephrine. Every dead person gets a dose. Okay. All right. Now what do we do? So let's hope we made that situation temporary and we brought that guy or gal back to life, right? Yay us. Um, how are we going to do this? So we have return of spontaneous circulation. That's what ROSC means. All the rules don't go out the window. Now we're going to do all our ABCs again. So we're going to make sure that we're optimizing our A and B, our ventilation and oxygenation. So we may have an advanced airway. It may is probably not the optimal. If someone requires uh, chest compressions, 
they're probably getting an advanced air, airway, all right? And that's uh, stuff for another class. All right, so now we're gonna treat, um, if the patient has hypotension, a systolic blood pressure of less than 90, we're gonna do a few things. We wanna give them some fluid. And so we, we always give fluid before we give a push, okay? If we squeeze the tubes without anything in there, it's not gonna help our patient. So we wanna fill the tank up by giving them a bolus, and then we want to squeeze what's there. That's what a vasopressor is for. And there's a couple of ones that we use regularly, okay? There's epinephrine, there's dopamine, and there's norepinephrine, all right? So if our patient is hypotensive, we wanna fill them up with a, a fluid bolus, so one to two liters of normal saline or lactated ringers. That's what I'm talking about, IV bolus. And I'm not talking about this bolus. A bolus means we give it over a short period of time. I'm not talking about a liter over four hours. I'm talking about a liter over an hour or a half an hour. We want them to get a lot of fluid because they were just dead and we brought them back and now we wanna keep them that way. All right, and th all these reversible causes, the H's and T's, that's what the physician is there for. But if you have a hunch, like, you know, he complained of crushing chest pain before he died, then, you know, we might think, oh, that's probably a coronary thrombosis or a PE, all right? Okay, and then they would go, you know, 12 lead EKG and all that other stuff, okay. All right, so let's talk about norepinephrine. Because um, we talked about epi, already and we've talked about dopamine last week so in the part one of this we talked about epinephrine and dopamine now we're going to talk about norepinephrine so norepinephrine is an alpha agonist so really primarily it affects um, blood pressure more than it doesn't really affect heart rate that much so it's a catecholamine alpha agonist um, and it acts as a extreme vasoconstrictor. So it's squeeze, it's the squeeze. Remember, we wanna fill the tank up first. So we wanna give them a bolus, then we wanna squeeze it. So it's usually after IV fluid boluses have been administered, okay? And then we give them fluid and their blood pressure still didn't come up, so now we need a squeeze, okay? This med is used a lot for sepsis. So next semester, when we talk, start talking about septic shock, you're gonna hear more about norepinephrine. So it's an alpha agonist. So what's nice is if we have a patient who has a low blood pressure, hypotensive, chances are our heart is going to be trying to compensate for that by speeding the rate up. We don't wanna throw more fuel to the fire and give them something like epi or dopamine if we can help it. So we give someone an alpha agonist just for the squeeze, okay? Um, because it's an alpha ag agonist, it usually causes a rise in blood pressure without affecting heart rate. And the dose is 0.1 to 0.5 mics per kilogram per minute. All right, so it is an extreme vasoconstrictor. So it can cause a rise in blood pressure, that's the expected response, but it can happen really quickly. So um, we need to make sure that our patient isn't showing signs of my myocardial ischemia. So we wanna make sure that we're monitoring the patient on a cardiac monitor and we're monitoring vital signs frequently on this patient, right? Also, with all of these pressors, with epi, dopamine, and norepi, especially with norepi, um, it's a vesicant, so they should be administered through a central line. So like an IJ or a PIC or a, an implanted port, something that is a central line. It's, I can't um, say this enough that severe tissue necrosis can occur if this is being um, placed through a peripheral line and it infiltrates. Like parts of their arm will die and slough off. Now. If this is happening in a code situation, do we always have the opportunity to take a few minutes and place a central line? No. So if the, the point is, is that they're going to die if we don't give them the medication, then we will give them the medication. But we also want to advocate and say, you know what, um, while this is going in, why don't we have the physician come in and, and do a central line if this medication is going to be needed for um, any extended period of time? 
All right. If anyone needs a central line, it's someone that just died. Right. So we should advocate. Um, be very, very careful. If it has to be done through a um, peripheral line, it should be done in the largest gauge possible. So this isn't going to go into a little itty bitty baby 22. We want at least, you know, an 18 or a 16. Okay.